Welcome to CPH Faith Courses and this course, Timeless Truth. This course was designed for you to be able to complete in one hour. So be sure to print out the learner's guide. Go ahead and fill that out as you go through the video. You'll come into the middle section where there are two activities for you to complete. Discuss this with others. Invite other pastors and DCEs and teachers and other church workers in to go through this course with you. We pray that this course would be a blessing to you and for all of those that you teach. Now to Pastor Jerkin. Hi. My name is Reverend Pete Jerkin, and I'm an editor of Curriculum Resources here at Concordia Publishing House. Welcome to this mini course for the book, Timeless Truth, An Essential Guide for Teaching the Faith. You see, before coming to work at Concordia Publishing House, I served as a parish pastor. And going into parish life, I thought I knew how to teach. I mean, after all, I got my undergrad degree in secondary education, I did my student teaching, and Hey, I was a student for lots of years, including the seminary. But when I went to my first call, I found out there was a lot I just didn't know, especially for teaching in the congregation. So I went back to school, I got my master's in education, and spent the next three years practicing things, thinking about things, and writing about how to best construct curriculum and teach the faith in the parish. See, this is pretty much a summary of all the stuff I wish I'd known about teaching in the parish before going into the parish, and it's our gift to you. See, that's the focus of this faith course. Over the next hour, I'll be guiding you through some things to think about with the purpose of teaching in the parish, a model for thinking about how everything works together, and a few exercises to help you get more out of your teaching. All of this is done, though, with the singular focus to help your learners get more out of their learning experience. So let's dig in this together and see what we can learn about teaching the faith with each other. So why teach? It starts with remembering that God's Word gives life. God's Word speaks forgiveness to us, faith to us, new life to us. We receive it in the sacraments. We receive it when we hear it. And when we read it, when we remember it, it, it's that important. But another reason we teach is to equip people to be lifelong receivers of God's Word, so that they can understand what God's Word says and what it means, so they can faithfully and joyfully receive it in worship, but also on their own. It's so important when we think about any part of our parish education program, like confirmation, or Sunday school, or Bible class, or ladies' aid. We teach to educate, equip, and empower God's people to joyfully and faithfully receive the gifts of God's Word for life. That's why. So where do we start when teaching God's Word? Well, there's different ways to go about it. See, what I'm proposing is one method of thinking through what we teach. Experience tells us that there's just so much to cover. There's so many details. There are books, the Bible, Bible literacy, doctrine, habits, practice, life application. <laughs> Where do we start? One way is to not think about all these details, but instead think about the big questions we ask when approaching life and the big answers we get from God's Word. So, what are these big questions? Well, there's the question, who am I? Then, who is God? Then, how do I live under God? And then, how do I interact with God? And how does God interact with me? See, there are more questions, but these kind of form the basis for most of the other questions people bring with them wherever they go through life. Here's the thing. Christians have used a simple yet powerful summary from or about God's Word for thousands of years that forms the basis for answering these questions from God's Word. In many ways, these statements form the backbone of Luther's small catechism. <laughs> you see, a catechesis is simply teaching the timeless truth of the faith to others, not only so that they understand the faith, but also they can have the proper foundation for receiving and understanding God's Word. For the question, who am I, we look to the Ten Commandments. These help us understand the timeless truth that God has a plan for me as his human creature. We are to love him and to serve our neighbor. They also show us that we cannot live according to God's will. They reveal to us our sin and our need for a Savior. 
For the question, who is God, we look to the Apostles' Creed. This helps us understand that timeless truth that God has created, redeemed, and called me to be his own. This is the summary of the narrative of Scripture, providing a foundation for understanding who God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, with the major focus on Christ. For the question, how do I live under God, we look to the Lord's Prayer. This helps us understand the timeless truth that God invites me, his redeemed child, to daily commend my life to his plan. In other words, as God's forgiven people, we're to receive the gifts of God's word and commend our lives to his care. The Lord's Prayer, the battle cry of the faith, sums up how we are to go about asking for these blessings in our lives. Finally, for the question, how do I interact with God and how does God interact with me? We look to the means of grace. These help us understand the timeless truth that God's word is living and active in my life. Baptism, confession and absolution, and the sacrament of the altar, along with hearing, reading, meditating on scripture, these are the ways God delivers forgiveness, life, and salvation to us. See, God is not far from us. No, he, he is near in the means of grace. So, What's the use of approaching God's word from a standpoint of simple statements like this? See, it gives us an opportunity now to focus on how we teach it. Think of it this way. Have you ever tried to teach something like the fourth commandment in confirmation and gotten overwhelmed? There's just so much to teach and so little time. See, there's the text of the catechism. There's different Bible narratives. There's different questions people have about right and wrong and in different ways to try to connect it to life. By distilling the fundamentals of the Ten Commandments into a timeless truth statement, we now have a starting place for thinking about how people understand something. See, these statements all have necessary answers, but there's always more to learn about them as we dig into God's word for life. You see, we can all understand a simple statement in different ways. I'm not talking about relativism that says we all find our own truth. Not at all. See, God's word is truth. What I'm talking about is the different angles we use to approach something that's really deep and rich. I mean, think of going to an art gallery and looking at a statue. The statue is there, it's real, it's not gonna change. As someone watching, you can look right at the thing and get a clear idea of what it is. But if you really want to appreciate the thing, you know, get to know it and understand it more, what do you do? You walk around the statue. You look at it from different angles. You look at it close and from far away. And the more you move and look, the more you can appreciate the thing. See, that's how we approach God's word. We don't just hear a narrative once, get it, and then move on. We don't just read the catechism once, then move on. We keep learning for life. Like I said before, the timeless truth statements have a necessary answer, like God has a plan for me as his human creature in the Ten Commandments. And as we dig into God's word, we never finish investigating or understanding what that means for us. There are many different ways we understand something, but there are five that are not only based around educational theory and principles of interpretation, but are also easy to remember. We call this the five angle framework. And they're this, one, content. Learn and confirm the content of the timeless truth. Can your learners explain the basic truth, memorize them, summarize them, put them in their own words? Two, context. Learn and confirm the timeless truth in the context of God's plan of salvation. Can your learners understand the timeless truth in a Bible narrative, seeing how to interpret Bible history in light of the timeless truths of God's word? Three, confession. Learn and confirm the timeless truth in relationship to different confessions of truth. Can your learners take a step back, compare and contrast the timeless truth of God's word to false claims of truth in the world, critically looking at other belief systems and defend their faith? Four, Consideration. Learn how to consider blind spots and shortcomings in my understanding of the timeless truth. Can your learners look at their own biases and assumptions when looking at the timeless truths of God's word? Are they able to know what to look for in God's word for answers? Five, connection. 
Learn how to connect the timeless truth to daily life. Can your learners faithfully apply the timeless truth to their lives and overcome the tendency to think of their faith and their daily lives as two separate things? See, though this may seem complex, it's not meant to be. Instead, this model, this five-angle framework, is a way to help you simplify how and what you choose to teach. We'll go into more depth of this coming up, uh, but for now, consider something you'd want to teach. If you want to teach a truth of God's word, consider not only what you want to teach, but the angle or angles you want to teach. Will you do a more straightforward study of doctrine? Well, then consider using the content angle. A study of Bible narrative? Then consider approaching the timeless truth from the context angle. An apologetic study? Then the confession angle. You want your learners to do some self-reflection or focus on life application? Then approach that timeless truth from the consideration or the connection angles. See, the point is to not only help you think about how and what to teach, but to think about why you teach and how the different things you teach to different learners at different times all works together to build upon the same timeless truth.
Session two is all about unit design. In the last session, I talked about the big picture, the timeless truth statements, and the five angles to give you a framework of how to both keep your teaching on God's word big and epic, but also on choosing focused approaches that work best for your learners. So let's try that out. I want you to think of a unit of instruction or teaching that you've done before, or are planning on doing again soon, or would just like to try out. Uh, by unit, I mean a big chunk where you focus on an idea or a theme or a section of scripture. It has to have a beginning and an end. Pull out the unit planning sheet that I made for you, and here's what I want you to do. Think about the unit you want to do. At the top, write down the name of the unit and how many sessions you're thinking you'll have for that unit. As an example, maybe four sessions, one hour a week. Then consider what timeless truth statement or statements you're going to use. I know you really haven't gotten into this much yet, but give it a try. What is the key statement you want your learners to understand, and what's the driving question that will get them to understand it? You can certainly use one of the above. These are time-tested and based on the catechism, but you could also use one of your own. Then what sorts of angles for learning and confirming the timeless truth of God's word are you going to do? The five different angles, or words beginning with con, are listed at the top of the sheet. Circle one or more on that list of angles used for the unit. Again, this is getting you focused on how you're going to teach. Now, on to the unit planning itself. If you wanted to check how much each of your learners knows about the class before starting the unit, what would you do? Would you give them maybe a little test, or have each one write down a fact or two about what they already know? Consider writing down what you'd have them do in the pre-assessment options section. Next, if you had to break down the unit based on one big idea and question that accompanies it, how many lessons would you want? Write that number of lessons in the unit down in the space titled number of lessons. Then, in the objectives or lesson focus section, write down what you would want your learners to know or be able to do for each lesson. Remember, this is not what you're going to do for the lesson. This is what you want your learners to know or be able to do by the end of the lesson. Not, I will teach them to this, or my learners will read through that. But think, my learners will know the names of the book of the Pentateuch, or my learners will be able to compare Joseph from the Old Testament to Jesus in the New Testament. One per lesson is a good place to start, but up to three works well too. Finally, for each lesson next to the assessment or checks for understanding, write down one to three potential ways you'd be able to check to see if your learners actually learned what you wanted them to learn. Again, this is not what they will do as an activity or what you will lecture on, though you're probably thinking of that right now. This is how your learners would demonstrate to you or to their fellow learners if they got the idea. Traditionally, we think of these things as tests, but it doesn't have to be. Each learner could write down what they learned on a piece of paper and leave it with you before they go, or they could just turn to a neighbor and share what they learned and you could listen in. Think of different ways. At the end of the planning guide, under summative assessments, think about how your learners might be able to demonstrate what they learned at the very end of the unit. Again, this doesn't have to be a test. Think about what they could do to show you themselves or each other what they've learned. I mean, it could be a paper, an email, or just sharing with a member of a small group. But write these down. See, there are more ideas in the Timeless Truth book, especially in chapter 8. But now is the time for you to try it out. You don't have to be perfect or have complete thoughts. I mean, the main point, really, is just to get you thinking about these things in order to help you get the most out of your teaching and get your learners to get the most out of their learning.
Okay, so there's a lot coming your way. Hey, if you don't get everything filled out or you're stuck on something, or for now you'd rather just think about what's going on, that's fine. Again, the point is just to get you thinking. In the last session, you roughly mapped out a unit. So now let's try that for one lesson, to drill down in what you could do for one session. So look again at one lesson on your unit sheet. Pick one that's interesting. Now take out your lesson planning sheet and write down the objective or objectives you'll focus on for this lesson. Again, one is fine. It's what you want your learners to know or be able to do by the end of the lesson. A good rule of thumb when writing an objective is to think about what you want your learners to learn as a result of being in your class. This is not what you will have your learners do in class. Those are learning experiences. Instead for objectives, think about writing, by the end of the lesson, my learners will know this or be able to do that. When you write an objective, think about how your learners will demonstrate their learning throughout the class at the end of the class when you check for understanding. Think about a piece of knowledge or understanding or performance that you could measure. An example of this could be, by the end of the lesson, my learners know the books of the Old Testament. That's demonstrating knowledge. And you could check in a variety of ways, you know, verbal or written. Another example could be this. By the end of this lesson, my learners will be able to explain the two natures of Christ in their own words. See, this one's much more complicated, but it is still something your learners could perform. In this case, explain it. If you have your learners explain what they've learned about the two natures of Christ, you'll really be able to tell what they've learned about this during the class. You will be able to more clearly see where your learners are in their learning and how you can adjust your teaching. Again, think specific verbs like explain, connect, describe, compare, remember, analyze, summarize. Then for each lesson, do the same at the bottom of the page under assessments or checks for understandings for each lesson. If you have a clear objective or objectives in mind, then the checks for understanding should connect to those. Again, these don't have to be tests in the traditional sense. These are just ways for your learners to demonstrate for themselves and for you what they've learned. These can be as simple as having your learners share what they learned with a partner, or writing down a one-sentence note to you. They can be as complicated as a written paper or a quiz. Either way, they are there to help each learner remain engaged in the learning process and to help you get a better understanding of what has been learned. Think specifics and verbs. What will each person do to demonstrate understanding? Now, on your lesson planning sheet, you get to fill in the gaps or create a kind of map. Think through the steps you'd want your learners to take that will get them from the objective as an idea in your head to something they will be able to demonstrate for you as a check for understanding. Think of the kinds of steps you'd like to take with them. Would you start with an opening question or an activity or a mini lecture or a devotion? What different things would you do? And how long would you take for each? Would having each learner listen to a lecture be the best way for them to understand what they're able to do or what's expected of them in the objective? Or would it be better for them to listen for a bit then express their thoughts together in small groups? You have to determine what you think is best based on your learners, your objectives, and your checks for understanding. Examples of different kinds of learning experiences are laid out in detail in Chapter 6 of Timeless Truth. You can look at that later. But for now, brainstorm what sorts of things you'd like to do with your learners and lay out a map for each step, keeping in mind that each one will take time and guessing how much time you'd spend on each. Take a minute and map out a lesson plan for one lesson of your unit. And when you're done with this, share with a partner in a group.
Now that you've done some basic brainstorming over unit plans and lesson plans, let's move on to some final thoughts. Teaching isn't easy, and plans don't, well, always go according to plan. It's not fun, but it's understandable. You can make all the plans in the world, but sometimes schedules change or your learners just don't have the background knowledge or whatever. You really can't anticipate these things. But there are some things you can do to help overcome them. Chapter 7 in Timeless Truth lays out three different strategies that you can take for overcoming obstacles to your teaching. These aren't the only ones, but they are strategies that people have found helpful. Number one, consider your environment. Take a look at the space you're using to teach. Take a hard look at it. Maybe you don't have much flexibility. Maybe you do. But regardless, I'd submit there's always something you can do or something you can consider that may help you or your learners focus more on the learning task. So what do you look for? Think about the space, lighting, seating arrangements. Are things bright enough? If you're asking your learners to interact with each other, how is there seating for that? If you're asking your learners to listen and take notes, is their seating arrangement making it hard for them to concentrate? If there's another option for your learning space for you that might work better, what is it? I know it may seem silly, but learning environment matters a lot when it comes to things like keeping attention or getting distracted. Also, consider what curriculum and assessments you're using. Is one technique that you think will work well actually working? What are your classroom rules? And do your learners know them? I mean, take a step back and really try to be objective about the learning experience of your learners. You might find something there that you can use to help keep your learners on track. Number two, consider collaborating more with others. It may feel like you're on your own, but it doesn't have to feel that way. There are different ways that you can talk through issues with a fellow teacher or pastor or volunteer, either inside your congregation or in a neighboring congregation. If you do reach out to a friend or coworker to talk about your teaching, remember it's important to stay on task. It's easy to only gossip or complain about how things aren't working, and this isn't really helpful. Instead, consider sitting down with a friend or sharing on the phone things like shared goals for teaching or creating checks for understanding together, sharing lesson plans or maybe sharing tricks of the trade, and praying for and with each other. It's amazing what insights you can gain from someone if you're both open to learning with and from each other. The hardest part is just taking that step and reaching out. Number three, consider the motivation of your learners. What do you use to motivate your learners and what motivates your learners to learn? I'm not asking this question to get you to use some sort of gimmick or to get you to pander to your learners. Instead, I'm asking because motivation matters. Remember these things. Motivation will always be an issue in parish education. Probably, motivation will always be a factor for your learners. External motivation will always be a factor to motivation, and you can't get away from it. But what you can do is work to build trust between you and your learners. Once you've demonstrated that trust, you can ask them what motivates them in life. Often, your learners are willing to answer. Find ways to use that knowledge of what motivates them in other things to motivate them in your class. Challenge them to think about setting their own goals for learning. And as you build a relationship with them, you'll see ways to encourage them to become well, more self-directed. There are others, but these three are examples of ways you can help overcome challenges in your learning. To close, I'll leave you with a question to ponder. What are some of the challenges or obstacles that you've run into in your teaching? How have you worked to overcome those?
What a great hour. We would hope that you would take the information that you've learned in this course, Timeless Truth, and apply it to your next unit of study in your parish or in your school. We pray that this would be a blessing to you as well as to all of those that you teach.